Good afternoon, students. As you all know that we have been discussing body fluid compartments and the role of extracellular and intracellular fluid. First, we will revise the previous lecture and then we will move forward. So, first we have discussed the first objective that was enumerate various body fluid compartments and what is the composition of each fluid compartment in the body. So, we have discussed in detail the various compartments as you can see here and the composition of different compartments in the body, the major cations and anions of extracellular and intracellular fluid, and the other substances which are present in various compartments. After that, the second objective that we discussed was how fluid intake and output is balanced inside the body. Okay, and after that, we have discussed the role of indicator dilution principle in measurement of extracellular and intracellular fluid volumes. In this, we have seen the role of principle of conservation of mass and how it can be used to measure the fluid volumes in different body fluid compartments. So we have used this formula. And we have seen the various indicators that can be used to measure the volume of different fluid compartments in the body. The next objective that we discussed was uh, define osmosis and correlate various terms related to osmosis. So we have seen the difference between osmolality and osmolarity and then we have seen the difference between osmolarity and molarity and after that we have seen what is an isosmotic fluid, what is an hypoosmotic fluid, and what is an hypo hyperosmotic fluid. And after that, we have seen the difference between tonicity and osmolality. So you just have to remember this point that osmolality refers to the number of particles regardless of their permeability, means that both the permeant and non-permeant particles will contribute towards osmolality. While tonicity refers to whether a solution will cause change in cell volume means that only the number of non-permian particles are going to determine the tonicity there is no role of permeable particles in determining tonicity for example if a substance is freely permeable through the semi-permeable membrane it will not contribute towards tonicity okay but it can contribute towards osmolality so we have examples over here sodium chloride is a solute that is not permeable through the semi-permeable membrane so it will per, it will contribute towards both tonicity as well as osmolality on the other hand we have another solute which is called urea urea is a substance that can freely permeate the semi-permeable membrane it's a freely soluble uh, freely permeable molecule so urea will contribute towards osmolality but it, it will not contribute towards tonicity as you can see here then we have another example there is another solute which is called glycerol not mentioned here but glycerol is a substance that can cross a semi-permeable membrane but slowly which means that glycerol slowly crosses the semi-permeable membrane so it is going to contribute towards tonicity initially but when it has crossed the semi-permeable membrane then it is not going to contribute towards the tonicity so let's clear these concepts with the help of few examples the examples uh, we will mention in our next video keeping the concept of osmosis osmotic pressure, tonicity, osmolality in mind, we will see how it is going to affect the movement of water across different compartments inside the body. So let's see this with the help of an example. We have taken a beaker and we have placed a cell inside the beaker, which has an osmolarity equals to the osmolality of the cells inside the body. That is around 300 milliosmoles per liter. Okay. And we have placed a cell inside a solution containing 200 milliosmoles sodium chloride. So just take a moment to think that water is going to move into which compartment. Remember that osmosis is defined as the movement of water molecules from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. 
low to high movement of water from low to high so over here we can see that this solution has lower osmolarity as compared to this cell so water molecules are going to move from the beaker inside the cell resulting in swelling of the cell so the same thing happens inside the body if there is differences in osmolarity in different compartments of the body the water is going to shift from low solute concentration to high solute concentration resulting in swelling of the cells similarly in this example we can see a solution having an osmolarity of 400 milliosmoles and if we place a cell having an osmolality of 300 milliosmoles then what is going to happen okay now remember again the movement of water molecules from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration so it's mean that now water is going to move out of this cell and this cell is going to shrink the same thing happened inside the body keeping in mind that this osmolarity is contributed by the by sodium chloride let's take another example now we have if we just change the units like we have uh, changed osmolality with molarity so always remember we have discussed this before that uh, 150 millimoles is equivalent to 300 milli of smoles of sodium chloride so nothing is going to happen over here let's take another example over here now we have a solution containing 200 milli of smoles of urea so you know that urea is a freely permeable particle and a particle that is freely permeable it does not contribute towards effective osmolarity so to make things easier whenever we have a urea we consider it as zero osmolarity is zero so what is going to happen over here the water is going to move from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration over here the effective osmolarity is zero because of urea so the water is going to move from this solution inside the cell resulting in swelling of the cell okay another example we have here okay interesting now we have 200 milliosmoles sodium chloride and 200 milliosmoles crystal if we combine these the osmolarity of these two particles we can see that it is going to be 400 milliosmoles okay now what is going to happen if we place a cell having an osmolarity of 300 then what is going to happen just think for a moment obviously you will say that the water is going to move from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high over here it's 300 and in this beaker we have 400 200 plus 200 equals to 400 so obviously the osmolarity is more over here as compared to inside the cell water is going to move from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration but on the other hand remember that glycerol is a particle that can slowly cross the cell membrane so once this glycerol crosses the cell membrane the osmolarity is going to be 300 over here and 400 over here because glycerol is going to be equally distributed across the semi-permeable membrane so 100 will stay here 100 will go inside and what it is going to do 300 plus 100 is going to be 400 and 200 plus 100 is going to be 300 so now the osmolarity has shifted it is more inside the cell as compared to beaker so initially the cell is going to shrink and later on the cell is going to swell hope these things are clear with the help of the example now we will apply these examples 
inside our body and we will try to correlate them with clinical abnormalities of fluid volume regulation. Now we will discuss the sixth objective, that is the clinical abnormalities of fluid volume regulation. We will discuss the clinical abnormalities with the help of a diagram which is called the stereounit diagram. As you can see over here, the x-axis is representing the volume and the y-axis is representing the concentration of solutes. So uh, this portion, this box over here is showing the extracellular fluid, that is the volume and the concentration of solutes in the extracellular fluid. And this box over here is showing the volume and concentration of solutes in the intracellular fluid. This whole diagram is termed as Darrow-Yannett diagram and we will see the, the effect of various clinical abnormalities on the fluid volume changes in both these compartments. First of all, if there is loss of isotonic fluid from the body, remember that the first change is always going to take place in the extracellular fluid. First, there is change in the extracellular fluid and then this change is going to affect the volume or concentration of solutes in the intracellular fluid. So if there is loss of isotonic fluid, now what do you mean by isotonic fluid? A fluid which has the same tonicity as that of the body fluids. So, which means that it has an osmolarity of around 300 milliosmoles per, per liter. So if there is a loss of fluid from the body which has an osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles from the body, what is going to happen? Only the volume is going to shrink. The volume of extracellular fluid is going to reduce. The dotted dashed line over here is representing the volume of fluid that is being lost from the extracellular fluid while the concentration of solutes remains the same. So if the concentration of solute in the extracellular fluid remains the same, it is not going to affect the volume or concentration of solutes in the intracellular fluid. The examples of loss of isotonic fluid from the body includes hemorrhage, formation of isotonic urine, and the immediate consequence of diarrhea or vomiting. Okay, the second example is if there is loss of hypotonic fluid from the body. Hypo hypotonic fluid means that a fluid which has an osmolarity less than that of the body osmolarity. So if there is loss of hypotonic fluid from the body, what it is going to cause? It is going to decrease the volume as you can see from the dashed line over here that actual volume was this. Now this volume has reduced and because there is loss of hypotonic fluid, so now the concentration of solutes in the extracellular fluid is more. Now the concentration of solutes in the extracellular fluid is more, so its osmolarity is going to increase. So this was the original osmolarity and now the osmolarity has increased. So these are the two changes that has taken place in the extracellular fluid due to loss of hypotonic fluid. Now how it is going to influence the volume of fluid in the intracellular fluid? You can see that because extracellular fluid has more osmolarity. So now the fluid is going to shift from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration resulting in loss of both volume but increase in osmolarity in intracellular fluid. So the end result is loss of fluid from both compartments and increased osmolarity in both compartments. What will happen if a person drinks one liter of tap water? Drinking one liter of tap water means that the person is taking fluid that has minimum or no solutes. So it is going to increase the volume of extracellular fluid. You can see the original volume was this and now it has increased to this amount. And because the fluid that has been taken into the extracellular fluid has no solute, so it is going to lower the osmolarity of extracellular fluid. So the total concentration of solutes in extracellular fluid is going to drop. So now the picture as you can see over here in the Darrow-Yannett diagram that extracellular fluid volume has increased and osmolarity has decreased. Now this portion has lower osmolarity as compared to 
this portion. So solvent or water is going to move from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. So this extra water is now moving into the intracellular space as well. The cells are going to swell up, its volume has increased and ultimately its osmolarity is also going to reduce.